As liberal groups in America continue their assault on Christian values and morality, it may seem to be a daunting task to find elected officials who are taking a stand in declaring their Christian beliefs while working to change public policy. Unfortunately, we see an assault on Christian values, whether that's in entertainment and arts, other spheres of culture, but certainly in politics. And that's the exact reason why it takes good men and women, Christian statesmen, to be involved in politics at all levels, but especially at the highest levels in Washington, D.C. The real damage comes in the breakdown of families, and all of that is upstream from politics. But that doesn't mean for a minute we leave politics just to go its own way. It means we see where the damage comes. We've got to start with faith and the crazy ideas, and then the damage to our families and to our schools, and then to go to politics to see politics change too. Standing for biblical values in government is difficult because a lot of times you may feel alone. So here at the Center for Christian Statesmanship, we feel like one of the ways that we can support Christian leaders is by recognizing them and praising them publicly, affirming what they do and letting not only them, but their constituency know that it matters. So what exactly is a Christian statesman? A Christian statesman is someone who not only do they have a private faith, but they have a public faith that they live out in the public square. They're bold and courageous in the things that they say. They take a stand for truth and they lead in a way where they're distinctively Christian. They don't compromise on their values and everyone knows that they truly are a distinguished Christian statesman by the way they live their lives. The D. James Kennedy Center for Christian Statesmanship recently honored Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears of Virginia with its 2022 Distinguished Christian Statesman Award. As D. James Kennedy said one time, what, we don't want any Christians, any God-fearing people in government? Should we just leave lawmaking to the atheists? And so that was one of the things that really started me on the path of thinking about politics in a totally different way. There have been many notable Christian statesmen throughout history, but William Wilberforce may be, perhaps, the greatest and a model for today. Through his steadfast resolve to work within the established government as a member of parliament, he spearheaded the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. So William Wilberforce is a wonderful example of a Christian motivated by their faith to make a difference in the world. He came from a place of um, high society. His best friend was uh, William Pitt Jr. who was to become the Prime Minister of England. So Wilberforce could have been politically very powerful, uh, financially. He had the world at his feet. Uh, he met Christ and uh, he thought maybe he should go into Christian ministry but eventually he was uh, persuaded that maybe his calling was in politics to make a difference to society. Wilberforce as a Christian his heart was really touched by the plight of slaves in the transatlantic slave trade. He saw that this was an evil, that it was a direct violation of Christian teaching in which we should value every human being regardless of color, ethnicity, culture, etc. Uh, when he became committed, uh, this involved quite a lot of sacrifice on his part because there was such opposition that it probably excluded him from higher office, uh, which he may well have achieved if he hadn't been such an ardent campaigner. But he was supported also by the Clapham sect, uh, again of uh, evangelical leaders, some of them ordained, some of them lay, uh, who worked um, not only for the abolition of the slave trade and of slavery, uh, but also to improve the working conditions of men and women in the United Kingdom. And many times, very often, they would meet here in Teeson to plan their campaigns. You know, my family, Guinness family, uh, Arthur Guinness was a friend and supporter of William Wilberforce, the greatest social reformer in history. I think just before uh, Wilberforce passed away, someone was able to inform him that uh, all that they'd been working for uh, had been legally passed. Um, and uh, so he's quite a hero of mine and many, and, uh, and a wonderful Christian example. But it's a lovely phrase if I must read briefly from a book which I and a colleague wrote called This Immoral Trade, Slavery in the 21st Century. But in the introduction, there is a reference to an author, David Vaughan, who wrote a biography of William Wilberforce. 
and he concludes with a summary of his characteristics as a model to inspire all who hold positions of leadership today. And I'll just quote briefly from it. Imitate him if you can. He served the cause of human liberty. And that's a mandate for all of us. Whenever human beings abuse other human beings, also made in the image of God, that is clearly abuse and injustice. The European Christians could see immediately that to have the Declaration of Independence and then to continue slavery was a hypocrisy and inconsistency. It was a great grief to the Christian abolitionists that America didn't step in at the beginning of the abolition movement. We have the greatest country in the world and it is because of the Constitution and it is because it believes and it espouses and it declares that all men are created equal, endowed by its creator, not by the government, but endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. I think the principles of our Constitution and our founding are timeless. Uh, they didn't take into account what was happening at that moment in history, and they're really applicable uh, not only for, for that time period or that decade, but really hundreds of years later. But many in recent generations, even those within the church, have been taught to only view the founders through the lens of slavery, which they use to essentially nullify the importance of our founding documents. There's no question that American chattel slavery was a deep moral evil, but it was also the status quo in the world of that time. And the founders composed these documents which contained the seeds of eventual freedom for everyone, which was unheard of in that era. Our founding fathers really did have a biblical worldview. Now, were they all Christians? Probably not. And I've heard this, well, you know, Jefferson was a, uh, a slave owner. Yes, he was. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone, you know? And even though they were not perfect, who of us is perfect? Um, they endeavored to create and establish a, um, a constitution and a country, a United States of America that would be as close to perfect as possible so that people could live out um, that, that their inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so we have to thank them for that. As a Christian, our passion has to be for all who suffer from slavery, from lack of freedom, from persecution, from injustice. So you absolutely should bring your biblical worldview, your morals, um, and your biblical values to you when you are governing, because ultimately God is government. He says, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So absolutely, they should bring um, their, their faith to their service to the people. If we don't take a stand and represent um, our worldview and uh, impose that on policy, uh, others with a different worldview will. Well, I think one thing to say about our Christian faith is that it's a real world faith. It's not just entirely mystical, it's all spiritual, but Jesus really cares about people and he cares about society. So you see that the way that he interacted with the poor, the outcast, those who are looked down upon. As Christians, we're really called to make a difference in our world and in our society. So it would be great for Christians to be involved in every sphere of society, politics, law, medicine, education, because the more we have Christians who are genuinely trying to make the world a better place, they're not doing it in their own strength, but they're doing it empowered by God and His help, uh, the more society will uh, flourish. Thank God for the heroes and those who are in the vanguard of reforms and freedom and justice. One of my favorite things about William Wilberforce is that he was elected to office in his early 20s. I think that's inspiring for a generation of young people who are looking to uh, come to the table, take the mantle, and move uh, the ball forward on the field, so to speak. I think that it shows that no matter what age you are, if God calls you and equips you to go do something, you can step out in faith and be successful. As D. James Kennedy Ministries continues to reach out to the next generation of government leaders, might the Center for Christian Statesmanship help train and motivate the William Wilberforce of this generation? I'm excited about the Center for Christian Statesmanship because we'll be able to equip and support leaders that go into a mess of a, a country and really clean it up in a way where it's not about them, 
It's about policy that will heal the nation in a lot of ways.